um, to the defense and then um, get done with the PhD. I feel like Martin has been already acting like a professor, though, so it almost feels like an overview. And it's especially um, impressive how only like maybe three years ago, um, when Martin was leading some of the early research toward the social common sense and social inequality and bias, um, the field um, didn't really wake up to that sort of research directions just yet. So uh, the initial reactions were more mixed, but um, Martin would just still uh, push ahead with enormous energy. And I'm so excited to see uh, what it, what all those um, innovative work culminates to, to uh, today's talk. So Martin, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you um, for that introduction. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone for, for being here uh, and tuning in. I'm really excited to defend. Um, I'm a little bit bummed that we can't do this in person, um, but because of the fact that this is virtual, we can actually uh, have people from all over the world. Um, so that's really exciting. And so to my friends back home, uh, merci beaucoup d'être venu. And to my family, I thank you for coming today and coming to the So yeah, today I am going to be talking about um, the research that I've done in the past like six years of my PhD, and uh, specifically, I'll be talking about how we can create NLP and uh, social common sense models, and with the goal of achieving positive societal impact. And so, jumping right in, um, when um, I talk about social common sense, um, I'm talking about this kind of reasoning that we as humans are really easily capable of doing, and it allows us to reason about various aspects of social situations. And so, for example, when we see something happen, like Tracy accidentally presses against Austin in a small elevator and it's awkward, we can all reason about why Tracy might have done this, and given two options like uh, flirt with Austin or squeeze into the elevator, we can pick out easily that um, it's more likely that Tracy wanted to squeeze into the elevator and this is why this situation happened. And so while it's pretty easy for us to do this kind of reasoning, um, it's actually really hard for current AI systems to think about these implications, despite the fact that uh, machine common sense has actually been a goal of artificial intelligence uh, since the eighties. And so in this talk and in my research, um, I've attempted to sort of bridge this gap towards social common sense reasoning with machines. And so specifically in this talk, um, when I'm talking about social common sense or social dynamics, there's a range of types of common sense that I'm talking about, starting with a reasoning about the causes and effects of interpersonal situations. So for example, reasoning about the motivations and the reactions that people have to events, as well as the likely events that proceed or follow, all the way to reasoning about biases and power dynamics between uh, social and demographic groups. So that's more about reasoning about the social biases or stereotypes about groups, as well as reasoning about toxicity and hate speech. And so in general, the long-term goal of my research is to achieve machine social common sense reasoning, uh, specifically by making natural language processing systems human-centric, socially aware, and equity-driven. And in a nutshell, one of the reasons why this is one of the most important challenges in AI these days is because if AI and NLP systems are going to be useful and safely deployed in our world, they must account for the fact that any data or human generated data that they're trained on is going to reflect social dynamics and social biases. And to be a little more concrete, I wanna walk you through some example NLP tasks that I've worked on that will require uh, this kind of reasoning about social dynamics in order to work properly and some failure modes to illustrate how they could uh, fail if they uh, don't account for these. And so one prominent example of an NLP application is conversational AI, uh, which is the task of creating um, digital assistants like chatbots and things like that. And so here, if you don't have um, social common sense or social awareness, your chatbot could end up being really forgetful or apathetic, um, but it could also end up having really offensive conversations or offensive replies. And so a very prominent example of that was when um, Microsoft released a chatbot on Twitter that turned um, into a racist uh, Nazi uh, sympathizer in less than a day. There's a second task uh, that is also prominent in NLP these days, which is the task of language generation, um, or broadly um, all about generating or auto-completing text, generating news articles, things like that. 
And here, if you fail to account for common sense, uh, not only can you have very incoherent or mindless generations, but also your models can end up being uh, very biased and generating very offensive uh, generations. And again, a very prominent example here is um, the fact that one of the biggest language generators out there um, also uh, is spitting out very toxic uh, propaganda and things like that. And then finally, there's a broad area of NLP uh, that is related to uh, understanding text. And specifically, I've worked on hate speech detection and things like sentiment analysis. And here, um, you could have a really bad performance on input by uh, minority users, or your, uh, your, your model could have really biased behavior. For example, some of my own research has shown uh, that hate speech detection systems by Google uh, could actually be really racially biased. Um, and flag African-American uh, tweets um, more often as toxic than uh, tweets by white authors. And so br just briefly a little bit um, of background on these tasks, um, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, we've seen um, our models get a lot better uh, at these tasks like conversational AI or generation um, recently since the advent of deep learning, which has actually made performance on these tasks skyrocket. And in fact, um, our neural models or deep learning models have seemingly got so good that people are under, under the impression that uh, AI is finally closing in on human intelligence or that uh, machines can now finish our sentences easily. And we've even seen articles written that, uh, by uh, robots. And so under the hood of this, um, this sort of impression is uh, this new uh, type of model called large pre-trained language models. And these are large neural networks that are trained on large amounts of text to predict which word comes next. Um, and I'll explain really briefly wh what exactly goes into these. And so the key reasons uh, behind those successes of these pre-trained language models is that they are trained on this very fundamental task of predicting a target word given its context. And so uh, this could either be predicting um, a word given its left context in a sort of causal language modeling setting, or it could be predicting a word given both the left and the right context in the more mass language modeling setting. And so the crucial thing about this task is that this is just about reading text. There's not really any labeling necessary. So you can just grab a bunch of data from the internet. Another part of, another component of the successes of these pre-trained language models is the fact, is this um, new neural uh, architecture called the transformer, which has um, allowed computation to be sped up significantly. And with computation being sped up significantly, we've also, uh, this has enabled researchers to actually scale the size of their training data sets into um, really massive uh, large data sets. And so in recent years, we've seen these training data sets going from just a couple of books or maybe a, a set of news articles to um, large dumps of random internet data that amount to almost 500 gigabytes of text. And then with the size of the training data increasing, we've also seen our models get a lot, lot bigger. And so we started back in 2018 uh, with models like ELMO, which were uh, just short of 100 million, uh, 100 million parameters, going to GPT, BERT, Grover, et cetera, all the way to GPT-3 released last year, which was 175 billion parameters and doesn't even fit on a single server anymore. And then uh, basically six months ago also, uh, Google released their switch transformer would actually cross the trillion parameter threshold. So again, a massively uh, massive language models that don't really fit on uh, our laptops or anything like that. And so um, with these models getting much, much better at uh, predicting which word should come next, uh, people have seemingly uh, see, or people have come under the uh, impression that these models are understanding language. But that's not actually true. And part of the reason why is that they lack common sense. And so if we sort of look more deeply into these models behaviors, we can see that they're actually nonsensical, they're behaving very mindlessly, and they're not really understanding text. And so part of the reason why this is, is because training a large model on large amounts of text does not give you common sense reasoning inherently. And specifically, the reason why that is, is because these models are trained to maximize the correlations between the input data and the output prediction of the word, um, as Udia Perl puts it, they're essentially doing curve fitting. They're not really trained to do reasoning or make inferences about social situations in the same way um, that I illustrated earlier. Additionally, um, while these, uh, you know, these models as training data is getting larger and larger, the knowledge that they can learn is inherently still gonna be limited to the knowledge in their training data. And this means that they're going to struggle to generalize to more specific or new domains. Like, for example, moving from internet data to the biomedical domain is going to be hard. 
Uh, but this also means that they're going to fall prey and learn uh, spurious correlations in their data, or what we would call, for example, data set biases. So things that are artifacts in the data that aren't necessarily things that you want your model to learn. And then finally, one last uh, reason why this, uh, these models aren't necessarily learning common sense is because the type of knowledge that um, they are trained on is knowledge that was written down or reported. And typically, because common sense is so obvious to most people, it doesn't actually tend to be written down because it doesn't need to be written down. So in order to achieve my long-term goal of uh, machine social common sense, this is going to require advances in three different fronts. Uh, the first one is we need to create new symbolic formalisms to distill common sense knowledge for machines to use. Then we also need to create new methods or algorithms for combining this symbolic knowledge um, with the neural knowledge that these models are learning. And then finally, we need to create new evaluations for uh, analyzing the knowledge and the biases that our models are learning to make sure that they're fair um, and equitable. And so during my PhD, my work has taken several steps towards uh, this goal of machine social common sense reasoning along these three methodological directions and specifically covering uh, reasoning about interpersonal social common sense um, to reasoning about social biases and toxicity. But today, um, I will focus on three projects uh, specifically. I'm first gonna start about, uh, with Atomic where I'm gonna explain uh, the creation of a large social common sense knowledge graph and how with that knowledge graph, we can teach machines to make inferences about the causes and effects of everyday situations. Then I'll switch to a different kind of social knowledge, uh, namely social biases. And here I'll show um, two projects on how we can represent and mitigate social biases in language. And then I'll briefly conclude with some uh, future directions towards um, achieving positive societal impact with uh, social common sense models. So I'll start with Atomic. So Atomic is an atlas of machine common sense. And so what I mean by that is a huge social common sense knowledge graph that contains um, almost 900,000 knowledge triples for AI systems to reason about the causes and effects of everyday situations. And so what I mean by an everyday situation is, for example, given an event like X repels Y's attack, as humans, we have common sense reasoning that allows us to make all sorts of inferences around this event, like why it happened, how participants feel. And Atomic distills this um, inferential knowledge into triples with nine different relations. And we represent this knowledge using short natural language phrases. And these dimensions cover knowledge around the causes of the event. So when X repels Y's attack, um, we can think about what needed to happen before. So maybe X needed to train hard or no self-defense before uh, X could repel Y's attack. But also maybe this happened because X wanted to protect others or save themselves. And this knowledge also covers the effects of the event. So after X repels Y's attack, what's gonna happen? So maybe as a result, X will want to file a police report or leave the scene, or maybe uh, X will feel angry or tired. Uh, but also maybe Y will want to attack X again or run home, uh, or maybe Y will feel weak or ashamed. And another way to think about this knowledge in Atomic is in terms of what happens to whom. Um, and so specifically, we can think about the inferences uh, that we can make about the agent or the person doing the event here, X, um, versus the types of inferences that we can make about the theme or the, the sort of subject of the event uh, here, Y. So one of the challenges that I wanted to highlight uh, for Atomic is that we want this knowledge graph to be useful for machines. And so um, in order for that to happen, we need our knowledge to be not only high quality, but also large scale. But how do you actually do that? So one way to try this is to um, extract common sense knowledge from text. But if you do this, you might find things like uh, murdering is four times more common than exhaling. And the reason that you would find something so, so surprising is because, as I mentioned before, text is subject to reporting bias, where you only tend to mention things that are noteworthy or events that are noteworthy. And in contrast, common sense is not often written down. And so you need, you need to do something else than extracting it from text. And so what we did is we elicited this kind of knowledge directly from people. And so we created a crowdsourcing framework on Amazon Mechanical Turk, where we collected short natural language annotations around event prompts. And uh, specifically, we, we used short natural language annotations because that's uh, natural language is how humans talk and think. And there's advantages to this approach. Um, this makes uh, 
these annotations much more easy to gather. And so this approach is more scalable than asking annotators to answer very specific detailed questions about things. Um, but also because these representations are in natural language, uh, this also makes it easier to integrate with other methods that work with natural language, for, for example, pre-trained language models. And so now that we have our large knowledge graph, um, we can ask, can we teach machines to make inferences about previously unseen events with Atomic? And um, as you may have guessed, the answer is yes. And that's what we did in our follow-up project, Comet, where we created a common sense reasoning engine by combining Atomic with pre-trained transformer language models. And let me just explain how this works really quickly. So basically in Comet, we took an Atomic triple and we linearized it, and then we taught a transformer model to predict a uh, target inference given an event and a relation. And so essentially, uh, this, is a, this is basically a conditional language modeling task where we're predicting the words in the target inference given the context of the previous words in the event as well as uh, the relation. And the crucial thing about Comet that we did is um, we initialized the transformer model using the parameters from a pre-trained language model, specifically here, OpenAI's GPT. And this was a language model that was uh, trained to predict which word comes next on a large corpus of books. And so I want to quickly illustrate how well this model works by uh, giving you an example um, and by feeding, basically by feeding an example event to Comet. And this is an event that uh, Comet has never seen. Uh, the event here is Martin gives a talk about his research, and we can ask it um, why I did this or why I'm doing this. And here the model predicts that I'm doing this because I want to share knowledge, be informative, uh, be heard, inform, or help. And um, we can also ask it uh, what I needed to do before giving this talk. And here it says that I needed to do research, be a scientist, and uh, be a professor. Um, and then we can also ask it what the effects are gonna be, specifically what the effects are gonna be on you, the audience. Um, and here the model predicts that after I'm giving a talk about my research, you will become, um, you will be informed, interested, uh, enlightened or knowledgeable. And as a result, you may want to ask me questions or listen to me. And I certainly hope uh, you do both. <laughs> So looking a little bit more formally into uh, the validity of these comet inferences, um, we can measure um, the effect of the pre-training uh, in, in terms of whether the model is doing well. And specifically what we can find is that um, the comet version where we don't initialize the model with the pre-trained language model uh, actually does significantly worse. So basically pre-training on the large corpus actually does improve the performance of, um, of our model in terms of the validity of the inferences. But interestingly, when we look at a breakdown of the performance um, of these inferences that Comet makes based on the different the nine different in, uh, atomic dimensions, we can actually see that the inferences that are made about the theme of the event or the other person or the why, um, Comet is uh, doing a lot less well compared to the inferences that it makes about the person doing the event. Um, so this leaves room for improvement uh, in terms of modeling in this area. So uh, briefly to summarize the contributions of Atomic, um, we introduced the first large knowledge graph of interpersonal social common sense, where we have our knowledge triples represented in natural language. With Comet, we introduced a reason reasoning engine that combines Atomic with pre-trained language models uh, to make inferences about uh, events. And specifically, we showed that there's still some room for improvement when uh, we're talking about inferences about other people. Um, and then since Atomic was created, this uh, project has also had some external impact. So uh, specifically, several groups have extended Atomic into uh, different knowledge areas uh, covering uh, sort of negated events, um, knowledge about uh, objects, as well as uh, combining um, text and visual uh, knowledge. And then uh, Comet has also been used to help improve a therapy chatbot, as well as sarcasm, simile generation, and also to make automated storytelling systems uh, better. So this concludes the part uh, on Atomic, which is the first project. Um, and so I wanna go back a little bit and revisit this notion of pre-trained language models. And so, as I mentioned, these are uh, kind of the backbones of uh, modern LP systems these days. And their basic recipe is to gather a large amount of text data, take a transformer model, and then train the model to predict each word given its context. And besides our um, model sizes getting larger, you know, we've seen our pre-training corpora uh, grow substantially. And so we've gone from using um, only quote unquote English Wikipedia and books to uh, using all documents that are uh, posted on Reddit, 
um, to um, using as much of the internet as we actually can. And so obviously here, um, this should raise some questions and I wanna kind of pause and ask, you know, our models are learning from arbitrary sets of language from the internet, what could go wrong? And so what could go wrong and actually does go wrong is that our models are actually really mindless and socially oblivious. And so not only are these models learning stereotypes and social biases um, from their training data, but they're also at risk for generating uh, really toxic content in less than hundred generations. So what I mean by that is if you were to sample a hundred sentences from one of these big models, you're likely to encounter something really offensive or toxic in those hundred samples. And so the issue here is as Professor Ruha Benjamin puts it, that feeding AI systems on the world's beauty, ugliness and cruelty, but expecting it only to reflect the beauty is a fantasy. And so what's missing is that we need, to, uh, we need a way to uh, capture the structure of social biases and power dynamics so that we can avoid those in uh, our model's outputs. And so that's where uh, my research comes in. And this is exactly what I'll be talking about next, uh, basically showing how we can represent and mitigate biases in, social lang uh, in language. And so I'll start with a project called Power Transformer. So, Power Transformer is an unsupervised controllable revision model for bias language correction. And here, when we're talking about bias, we're looking at, uh, like looking at it through the lens of connotation frames of power and agency. And so briefly, to explain connotation frames, um, what those are is a common sense formalism that I introduced in 2017 that distills connotational knowledge related to verbs. And specifically, it distills knowledge related to the power differentials between the agent and the theme of the verb or the, su the, object and, uh, the subject and the object of the verb. So for example, when someone is pursuing someone else, who has more power over who? It also distills knowledge around the agency that is attributed to the agent or the uh, subject, the person doing the event. Um, and here, someone with high agency tends to be someone who's very decisive, active or driving change. Uh, so, so that's someone who's doing a lot of finishing, wiping, beating, shooting, things like that. Whereas someone with low agency is someone who tends to be very passive and experiencing the events. So for example, that's someone who's resting, dreaming, waiting, pausing, things like that. And so uh, what we can do with these connotation frames is um, we can use them to analyze the way that characters are portrayed in various types of text, for example, in movies. And so in our original paper, that's what we did. We use a corpus of 700 modern movie scripts um, and we studied the agency levels of characters with respect to the character's gender. And uh, glossing over the details, what we found is that men were portrayed with significantly higher agency and uh, women were portrayed with significantly lower agency. So this, um, there's significant gender bias in these movie scripts. And um, the reason why this is happening is something that I like to call the cycle of social inequality in text. Um, and so what I mean by that is that we know that there is inequality uh, between minority and majority groups in the world. So for example, between men and women. And we know that language, the language that we use actually reflects the social dynamics and the social inequality of the world. And so then um, this social inequality will in turn end up written in text where oftentimes we'll find that minority characters are portrayed in biased or stereotypical ways. And then unfortunately, the way that minority characters are portrayed are, uh, is gonna influence our own view of the world and re can reinforce negative stereotypes uh, about minorities. And so this motivated um, our new task of controllable debiasing, which basically asks, can machines learn to revise text to debiased portrayals and essentially break this cycle of social uh, inequality in text? And so specifically, the goal of controllable debiasing is to take a story sentence like uh, May daydreams of being a doctor. And um, here May is portrayed with very low agency, very passively. And we're gonna take that sentence and rewrite it into May pursues her dream to be a doctor, where all of a sudden May is uh, a lot more decisive, has a lot higher agency. And so, there's two main challenges to doing this task. And the first one is that um, contrary to some existing work on paraphrasing, we can't just paraphrase the sentences because a lot of times these biases are not just in the framing of the action. Sometimes it's in the actions that are ascribed to characters uh, themselves. And so we need something more than paraphrasing. But on the other hand, we also wanna avoid making unnecessary meaning changes um, and we wanna preserve as much of the original meaning as we can. 
And so what we want to do is we want to hit that spot, that sweet spot of making targeted edits with minimal meaning changes. The second challenge is that this is essentially an unsupervised task because there's no parallel data. And so um, approaches where we can just learn uh, you know, the, from input to output easily uh, isn't really going to work. And so um, the way that previous work has tackled this sort of unsupervised uh, uh, rewriting task is using generator discriminator models, um, things like GANs or stuff like that. Um, and unfortunately, previous work has also shown that this doesn't tend to work very well because it often leads to non-grammatical or disfluent text. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to follow uh, Lee et al.'s approach of masking and reconstructing sentences. And because that wasn't really enough, we're going to add two novel modeling aspects to, um, to our model. Specifically, we're going to add an additional paraphrasing training objective, as well as a vocabulary boosting mechanism at uh, inference or generation time. And so um, briefly, I'm going to walk you through the, the way that the power transformer uh, model actually works. Um, so we start with an input sentence and a desired agency level T here. And we're going to mask all agency markers from the input sentence using our um, connotation frames lexicon. And then we're going to convert our desired agency level into a special token. And then we're going to feed those into a uh, transformer-based conditional language model that we here initialized with OpenAI's GPT. And then um, at training time, we're going to train this on our reconstruction and paraphrasing objectives. So we're going to teach the model to do both reconstructing and paraphrasing. And then um, at test time or at generation time, we're also going to use our vocabulary boosting uh, mechanism to achieve the desired output. And so to be a little bit more specific, um, when we're doing this training, we have two, uh, we have a joint training objective that has two parts. The first part is a in-domain reconstruction objective that basically takes in a sentence from our story corpus and then masks the agency markers um, and then optimizes the log likelihood of the reconstructed sentence. And then we have a um, out-of-domain paraphrasing objective, which uses pairs of paraphrases from a TV subtitles corpus, so nothing to do with the uh, sort of domain that we're working with. And um, there it optimizes the likelihood of the sentence given its ma mass paraphrase. So then at decoding time, the way that our vocab boosting mechanism works is basically it's gonna increase the likelihood of tokens that are uh, connoting the desired agency levels um, by adding a vocab size vector for the right agency level at each decoding time step. And so basically we're shifting the probability distribution upwards for words that um, are sort of desirable um, so that they're more likely to be chosen. And we can change the amount of shifting that we do uh, based on a parameter beta that we can set here. Okay, so that's a lot of components to this model, and um, we can actually look into uh, the usefulness of each of these components to make sure that they're actually contributing to improved performance, uh, specifically through ablation analyses. And so um, comparing to our full power transformer model, if we take out any of these components, we actually see um, uh, that each of these components actually leads to a performance gain. Um, so that's good news. But then if we wanna get a full sense of how our model is actually doing, uh, the issue is in NLP, automatic metrics for open-ended text generation uh, like this kind of task are actually pretty brittle. And so unfortunately, um, what we tend to do in NLP is then we have to do a human evaluation to get a sense of how great our model is. Um, typically we do this through crowdsourcing. And so um, this is what we did in uh, this task. Basically we designed a head-to-head -head evaluation task um, where we gave uh, crowdsourcing workers um, the output of two different systems. And we asked them which one better preserved the meaning of an original sentence that uh, the systems had rewritten, as well as which one better reached the desired uh, agency level that we wanted to achieve. And then we compared our main model to uh, the non-boosted version of Power Transformer, as well as um, two baselines from related but different uh, stylistic rewriting tasks. And so what we find uh, in a nutshell is that uh, the, both Power Transformer models are better at preserving the meaning compared to the other baselines. Um, but compared to all other baselines, our full power transformer model has actually the most accurate output agency levels, which is um, good news. So now that we've kind of confirmed or you know, have evidence that our model works well, we, I wanted to circle back to the movie scripts that I mentioned earlier and see how we can use power transformer to basically debias the way that female characters are portrayed in text. 
And so we basically did a case study um, with the movie scripts that we had in our, in our original paper. Um, so if you recall, men were portrayed with higher positive agency in uh, the movie scripts that we had. And so in our case study, what we did is we took the lines that described female characters and we rewrote them um, to have more uh, higher agency with our power transformer model. And so what we find is that in the revised scripts, not only do women have much higher agency than before, but if we actually measure the, uh, the gender effects, we can see that, the, um, that women now actually have significantly higher agency than male characters. And so obviously I would uh, sort of uh, say here that uh, this is a very broad swath approach um, since we rewrote even uh, the minor characters that maybe weren't supposed to be super high agency. But um, this is a, to, to, to us, this is a study that illustrates the promise for um, setting up human AI collaborative writing tools uh, to sort of help people um, write maybe less stereotypically. And so just to sum up the contributions of this power transformer uh, paper, um, we introduced the uh, new task of controllable deviasing of the portrayal of characters and sentences. Um, I also introduced a new common sense formalisms, which is the connotation frames of power and agency. And um, we also introduced our new model, uh, power transformer, which is an unsupervised approach to doing this controllable devising task. Um, and briefly, I also uh, quickly want to mention the external impact of this work. Uh, specifically, the uh, connotation frames of power and agency have been adopted uh, by several uh, groups to study the way that marginalized identities are portrayed, for example, in news, in media, uh, in school textbooks. Um, also, the connotation frames uh, were um, discussed in the latest version of uh, a very standard natural language processing textbook, uh, uh, specifically speech and, language process, speech and language processing, which was uh, really exciting. So taking a, li a little bit to a higher level, um, the power transformer results really highlighted the promise of using NLP tools for debiasing text and specifically highlighted this promise of doing this by combining common sense models with neural models. Um, and here we looked at uh, bias through the lens of connotation frames and we use pre-trained language models as a backbone. And these promising results raise the question of, could we come up with models that mitigate a broader set of social biases? And as you guessed, the answer is probably yes, but it will require designing new formalisms to capture this broad set of social biases. And so this leads me to the last project that I'm gonna talk about, which is called Social Bias Frames. So social bias frames is a formalism to reason about the social and power implications of language. And before I go any further, I do wanna warn y'all that the content in this talk, uh, in the rest of this talk may be upsetting or offensive because we're discussing things like biases and stereotypes and hate speech. And when we're uh, talking about social biases, we're approaching these from a US social cultural perspective. So, when people talk about uh, harmful biases uh, in text, there's usually two ways that these could be expressed. Um, one is a very overt way. So for example, when someone says we should kill all XYZ demographic group, um, we can all kind of agree that this is toxic and this is easily detected as toxic by uh, your off the shelf commercial uh, toxicity detection systems. But there's also a second type of bias, which is much more subtle. For example, in the statement, we shouldn't lower our standards just to hire more women. And so here, because of how language um, implicature works, we can all understand that this implies that women are less qualified than men. And this is a type of unconscious bias that is very harmful, but still is not really detected by your off the shelf uh, toxicity detection tools. And then in fact, this is flagged as fully harmless. And so um, this motivates our creation of social bias frames, uh, which is a new structured formalism that distills knowledge about the harmful and biased implications of language. And so specifically, the way that our social bias frame um, is structured is given a post or a statement, like we shouldn't lower our standards just to hire more women, we're going to ask a categorical question of, is this considered offensive or not? In this case, annotators said yes. Was this intended to be offensive? Here, uh, people said maybe. We're gonna ask, is this referencing something lewd or sexual? In this case, not really. If it is offensive, is this targeting a group or just an individual? In this case, it's a group. And then we're gonna ask a free text explanation of which group is being targeted. Here, uh, it's women. 
And um, we're going to ask a free text explanation of what the bias is or what the implication is. And here it's that women are less qualified than men. And then finally, the last variable in our frame relates to the um, in-group language and specifically it's trying to capture whether the statement is made by members of the same group that um, uh, the statement is targeting. And here that doesn't really seem to be the case. So the motivation for this task is uh, that, as I mentioned, um, if we want our models to be able to avoid socially biased outputs, um, models need an understanding of what they should avoid. Um, and so social bias frames is kind of a new view on representing this what to avoid or the social biases. And specifically, it's more holistic than uh, using binary hate speech or offensiveness or toxicity classification, not only because what um, constitutes something hateful or offensive can actually depend on sort of how people define it or uh, how, yourself, uh, how you yourself perceive uh, a statement, um, but also more importantly, the, uh, the, this binary sort of setup can actually backfire and can uh, be biased against the very minorities that it's trying to protect. And so, as I mentioned earlier, some of my own work has shown um, that uh, automatic uh, toxic language detection systems are actually racially biased and uh, tend to flag uh, speech by African-American authors as toxic more often than by white authors. And so uh, addition, in addition to being more holistic than binary hate speech detection, our uh, social bias frames uh, framework is also more trustworthy because it inherently comes with explanations of the implied biases. And so it can actually help educate people on uh, what's sort of what the problem is with a statement instead of just being an opaque percentage of toxicity. So um, in order to study these kind of social biases in the wild, we also introduced uh, the social bias inference corpus, which um, basically covers 150,000 social bias frame tuples that were annotated from 44,000 uh, different social media posts, including from Twitter, Reddit, as well as the neo-Nazi communities of Gab and Stormfront and some really um, misogynistic uh, subreddit communities that were banned like r slash incels. Um, and our corpus contains uh, 34,000 different implications, about 3,000 different demographic groups. Um, and so obviously I don't really have time to cover um, the details of how this was created, but I do wanna highlight two aspects of uh, this corpus. The first one is that uh, due to the way that we selected and trained our annotators, uh, this was actually pretty high quality. Um, and second is that the types of identities that are targeted in our corpus are actually representative or in line with uh, the types of discrimination that people report experiencing in real life. And so we're not capturing um, political disagreements online, but we're actually capturing uh, social biases that could have real world implications. So I also quickly wanted to highlight um, some of the uh, some aspects of the way that we designed this frame and the way that we designed our annotation. And specifically, I wanted to highlight the fact that this frame was grounded in social science literature. Specifically, we looked a lot at uh, literature of uh, rudeness, pragmatics, offense, and social psychology literature. Um, and this led to the inclusion, for example, of the variable of whether a statement was intended to be offensive or not. Um, and so not only do we know that uh, knowing the intent behind the statement can change the perception of offensiveness of a statement, but also if we think about incorporating this into, for example, a writing platform online, um, acknowledging that someone might have not intended to be offensive could be really helpful to soften the feedback um, to that author saying like, hey, this is still pretty biased. So that's why we included that variable as well. And then um, this also led our social science uh, sort of survey also led to the inclusion of uh, this in-group statement variable, which basically aims to capture the fact that some statements could be self-deprecating uh, when said by a group uh, member about that group member, about that group, um, but also things like reclaimed slurs can appear offensive if said by someone who's not a member from that group, but less offensive if it's said by someone from that group. Um, so it's important to uh, capture that in some way. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that um, a statement or a post can target uh, multiple identity axes, um, and so we allow for that in our annotation framework. Um, and then finally, the, um, the way that we ensured for high quality was also through uh, iterating over um, our design of our frame so that annotators um, could understand what we were trying to uh, model here. Okay, so um, with the frame that we designed, we now wanted to know um, how good are neural models of today at making these kind of inferences about uh, statements or posts using social bias frames. And so what we did 
is we set up a modeling case study. Basically, our task here is to predict uh, the entire social bias frame from a previously unseen post. And um, this is not fully trivial because this requires not only doing um, classification on some of these offensiveness intent variables, but also requires actually generating the words of uh, the group and the implied statements. And so a natural model for this, uh, which we use in our case study, is a GPT style model. And specifically the way that we set up this modeling is we took our frame um, and we linearized it uh, and we added special tokens for each of the classification variables. And then we passed them through a transformer based conditional language model, similar to how we did with um, Atomic. And basically we optimized or trained our model uh, using the negative log likelihood of all tokens. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how we trained our model. But then at um, generation time or when we're predicting a social bias frame, we're going to take our uh, previously unseen post and then we're going to conditionally generate uh, the linearized frame token by token. And the problem is, um, if you can see in this example here, the problem is that you can lead, you can get a generated frame that's inconsistent with the frame structure. And this is a known issue with this kind of setup uh, where uh, the structure of a frame isn't always learned properly. And so in this case here, the problem is that this post was predicted as not being offensive, but still having implications about a, a demographic group. And so what we need to do is enforce the structure post hoc. And so one very naive way of doing this is um, by doing top-down inference saying, okay, well, I decided that this post wasn't offensive, so then I'm not gonna make predictions about any of the variables that are under that variable of offensiveness. However, um, we could do something a little bit more holistic um, by doing some sort of global constraint inference where we're basically, can, we can let our um, future decisions correct some of our past mistakes that we made. And essentially, um, if we generated implications, we can flip that variable of offensiveness and say, oh, maybe this was actually offensive. And so if we look at sort of uh, the average classification performance of um, both of these um, sort of uh, inference metric methods, we can see that constrained inference actually slightly helps um, at uh, doing better at predicting these social bias frames. But when we look um, at each of the individual classification variables, we can actually see that the uh, lower level variables are much more challenging to predict. So for example, predicting whether something is uh, in-group language or uh, referencing a group versus an individual is much harder than predicting whether something is uh, offensive. And then if we look at the generation, so how well models are doing at uh, generating the implied statement or the group, what we find in a nutshell is that models are identifying the targeted group uh, pretty well, but uh, generating the implications or the, the biased meanings uh, behind the statements is actually much more challenging. Um, but I want to illustrate uh, the capabilities of these models with an example, uh, because I think it'll be uh, more uh, interesting. Um, so again, I want to warn you all that this next slide will contain some offensive content, uh, because this is an example of a biased statement. So uh, this is a statement that says, I love gay guys, they're so much fun. I would love to have a gay guy best friend, but lesbians are just annoying. And so here, the model predicts that this is offensive um, to a group specifically because it's targeting lesbians and it says that lesbians are annoying. And this is in line with what the annotators originally wrote, which was that, yes, this is offensive um, because it implies that lesbians are annoying. But this also was annotated as being a targeting of gay men, and specifically that it contains the stereotype that all gay guys are fun to be around. And so here, this illustrates that um, a model can be successful with predicting the um, implied biases, maybe because of over biases with verbatim cues, but um, the models are, tend to struggle with more subtle biases, such as uh, positive stereotypes, which are still known to be harmful, uh, but just not as negative in uh, their nature. So, uh, just to quickly sum up the contributions of social bias frames here, uh, we introduced a new formalism to distill harmful or biased implications of language. Um, we also showed through experiments that our models struggle to generate uh, the subtle bias implications, um, and maybe we need, and this motivates the need for models that can do better structured reasoning about people. And then finally, I should also really quickly mention that uh, this project has also had some external impact. Specifically, it's um, the corpus has been used in help, uh, to help detect subtle toxicity in language, as well as hateful memes. Um, and this has also led to some industry and cross-university collaborations. 
Okay, so this concludes uh, the part on social bias frames. And so I really wanted to quickly summarize the challenges that I've tackled in uh, the three projects that I described and then outline briefly some future work that I'm really excited about. So in this talk, I tackled several challenges. Uh, with Atomic, we tackled the challenge of how to represent knowledge about interpersonal social common sense at a large scale for machines to use. And then with Comet, we tackled the challenge of how we could um, make machines do inferences about social dynamics. Then with Power Transformer, we tackled the challenge of revising and debiasing text through the lens of connotation frames. And then in social bias frames, we tackle the challenge of how we could distill bias and harmful implications of, uh, in language by designing a new formalism to represent those. And so while these results from these projects were pretty promising, there's still some uh, you know, work left to do. Um, and so I wanna talk really briefly through some future directions towards achieving positive societal impact with uh, machine social common sense reasoning. And so um, there's three sort of uh, fronts that I'm really excited about in terms of future work. Um, the first one is this broad area of, um, of creating uh, more knowledge for machines to use so that they can reason about social dynamics. And so this is extending the family of uh, atomic social bias frames, connotation frames. Um, and so, for example, one thing that uh, I'm really excited about that is going to be really crucial towards culturally aware uh, NLP is uh, being is for those systems to be able to reason about social norms and morality. Um, and so there's a, a, a little chemistry icon here because there's some preliminary work that we did with some co-authors um, on distilling social norms um, um, evoked by situations. But um, there's still a lot of open challenges in terms of what kind of knowledge is needed for uh, you know, achieving true social common sense reasoning. The second front that I'm really excited about is uh, that we need to keep creating new NLP methods um, and algorithms for people-centric reasoning. And so um, on one hand, this, it's really important for our models to be able to reason about different participants of situations differently because social common sense is inherently a people-centric task. So this is kind of echoing back the findings on Comet where um, predictions on other people were harder to do than predictions on the person doing the event. But also as technology is uh, becoming increasingly prevalent in society, um, this also opens the door for a lot of really interesting human AI collaborative writing setups. And so we need to keep developing methods that can take on uh, human input at different stages of the pipeline or even work with humans from the get-go um, to be more people-centric. And then the third front that I'm really excited about is um, applying our social, socially aware models to uh, NLP applications specifically to uh, achieve positive societal impact. And so I'm really excited about developing socially aware um, text or dialogue generation. So dialogue systems that uh, avoid offensiveness, uh, even if it's very subtle, but also creating text revision or debiasing systems. Uh, for example, using power transformer with social bias frames or something like that. Um, I'm also really excited in furthering um, in, 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 get it, in achieving fairness, ethics, and justice with NLP systems. So for example, uh, designing models that work for, um, that, that work for uh, all types of populations, not just sort of uh, mainstream white uh, English, as well as uh, debiasing our, our models uh, post hoc or things like that. Um, and then finally, I'm also really excited in, uh, in the possibility of applying our, our models to uh, answer social science questions. For example, um, cognitive science questions about how people recall things or uh, things, uh, social psychology questions as well. And so with that, um, this concludes my talk. And I wanted to thank you all for, for listening and tuning in. Um, I also wanted to thank my collaborators without which I obviously wouldn't have gotten to this point. Um, and a special thanks to uh, my advisors, Noah and Yejin, um, and also to Tim and Sapna for agreeing to be on my committee. And um, I also, you know, finally want to mention that doing this PhD was a really long and hard process, and I couldn't have done it without um, the support of my friends and my loved ones. And I want to give a special shout out here on the slide to all the UW NLP, CSE, and UW folks. Um, or friends that um, only some of which I could find photos with. Um, but I'm really grateful that y'all agreed to have lunch with me at the office instead of uh, eating at our desks. Um, and that you, you know, agreed to go out to brunch or happy hour with me in general, just were there to support uh, me and celebrate. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all for listening and I'll take some questions now. <laughs>